Michael, I'm so delighted to have you here. First of all, how did you get involved with horses and specifically with Arabians and with Qatar and Al Shakab, the national stable? Getting involved in horses was an obvious birthright of mine. My father was a nuclear physicist and my mother was a professor at a college. <laughs> You get it, right? That <laughs> seems to naturally segue into that. And my father's phrase as I was growing up is, if I continue this path, I will be a functioning illiterate. <laughs> well, he grew to absolutely love the horses and love the horse shows. So I, from the earliest moment I can remember, I was loving to play in the dirt and be with horses and all animals, but horses the most. So. There wasn't ever a conscious moment where horses didn't play a huge role in, in giving me oxygen to this life. That's so wonderful. And Arabians, how did they come into your life? Accidentally, because at that point, I, was, I grew up in Albuquerque, New Mexico. We lived near the Rio Grande River, and our goal each day was to borrow a horse and head up the Rio Grande as far as we could and eat our sack lunch and ride back down. It happened at one point that I had a interaction with a, when I was nine years old with an Arabian horse person in Albuquerque and the U.S. Nationals were in Albuquerque in the 60s and I never looked back. That's wonderful. And then how did Qatar and Al-Shakab come into your life? In 1993, which was just after the, His Highness the Emir, the Father Emir, decided to embark on this grand mission of of repatriating Arabian horses to the country of Qatar, Sheikh Hamad bin Ali was in Lexington, Kentucky, where I happened to be. He introduced himself, and we started riding around on his golf cart, looking at horses. Now. That was scary enough <laughs> because he's a little bit unreliable, but beloved. <laughs> and love lovable. him to death, but uh, there is another story that I'll tell whoever wants to hear it privately about how you go from a golf cart to a Porsche with Sheikh Hamid, and it's not a good idea. <laughs> but so he bought a stallion for me named Sabil, and we, I showed him at that horse show. He was the gold champion. So. He and I started off successfully and uh, kept going. Oh, that's marvelous. And it, it really was. People say there's no luck in life, but it was so lucky for me to be at that horse show and, the, and him to be there because it did change Arabian horses in my life. Well, there's an Arabic word that is maktub. It means it was written. So maybe not luck, but fate, maktub. Um, what is it about Arabians that make them stand out from other horses for you? It's the it factor times 10. They, just as Mrs. Wyatt said when she saw Hariri al Shakab, he knew he was the king. There's something about their inner soul that radiates outward, and they have this keen intelligence, and they are great, wonderful, loyal friends, and they will do a lot for you. But, and then they're, they're just, they're beauty. They, they're called, and it's almost cliche-ish, but they're called living works of art. But if you do look at them in comparison to other breeds, which I, I love all horses, but there's just something just that much more exquisite. Well, we are very sorry, and I'm sure all of you are, that the weather conditions um, didn't allow us to bring one of the finest examples of Arabian horse, Hariri al Shakabin. It's um, we, Michael and I almost wish we, there was pouring down rain to justify the decision, but it is about a two-hour drive from New Elam, and there was thunder and lightning at the time we would have had to transport uh, Hariri, and you know this is truly a priceless national asset. So I hope you, with great understanding, um, there was a spot on the 4, four o'clock um, on ABC 13, so you can catch a glimpse of him on, on Elena Carson's spot there. Or come to New Ulm in person. Or come and to New Ulm. Yes, yes. Michael has the... Uh, <laughs> you all are welcome anytime. Michael has the biggest supply of carrots you'll ever see. But, um, so Hariri was named Platinum World Champion. What does that mean to be a Platinum World Champion stallion and what makes him so special? Well, from breed ideal, he fits every category with an exceptional amount. 
To be a platinum world champion, you had to be a former world champion. It's only open to horses that had been world champion previously. So with that title, he can go into the ring in Paris, France. He's judged by a panel of nine international people, and he was named the platinum world champion in late November this year, which added to his already world champion title and three times U.S. national champion stallion and uh, the Las Vegas World Cup. He has won every single title in the world from Germany to his home in Doha to Scottsdale to Paris and all places. That's remarkable. And the other thing about him. that's him, him there. Yeah. So the other thing about Hariri that's amazing is, I mean, he is a stallion and he loves his carrots. And Michael was holding a bag of carrots when we, uh, and I, I move, moved Mrs. Wyatt over to Michael's other shoulder because he did want to get at those carrots. But he's incredibly personable and gentle as well, which is, is remarkable. But one thing I love is this lineage. Uh, Hariri's father and grandfather were world champions. Are you surprised at how fast Qatar has been able to achieve such outstanding results? And along those lines, do you think there are parallels with the development of the Al Shaka breeding program and just the remarkable transformation that you've witnessed in Qatar itself? It's an amazing, spirited, enthusiastic, never say I can't do it country of people. When I first went there in 94 to start showing, there were two roundabouts getting from what was then the only hotel, the Sheraton Hotel, to the equestrian club, and it took about 15 minutes to get there. 20 years later, it took three hours to get across the town because it had grown so much and the, the skyline was so amazing. And then now it's back to 15 minutes because they've managed to build a super highway system, a subway system, mass transit, get the World Cup, get everything in because their ability to say that their narrative is we can do it. And that's the way they embarked in the Arabian horse too. They were determined to tour the world by the best blood stock that was available in the world. And they did with great taste and a mission, because you can't always do it with just money, but they've developed their country with beautiful grace and their horses. In every major competition in the world, a minimum of 80% of all the progeny in a given horse show that are winning descend to those original stallions you're talking about. That is remarkable. Well, I'll throw in a little thing. I always call Cutter, we probably, maybe some of the you, you youngins here don't remember, but there's a wonderful book called The Little Engine That Could. And that's what I think about Qatar, a country with, you know, less than, you know, only a few hundred thousand people um, and poverty stricken in 1950, um, December 1949, the first oil export and then what they've done with it, and particularly since 1995, when the then, the now father emir became emir. So really, you have to look at everything Qatar has done from 1995 to now, and it is uh, beyond amazing. It really does remind me a lot of Texans and Americans, because we have the same positive outlook that we can do whatever and however we want to achieve it, and the Qataris do the same. So it, it's a very interesting parallel point of view. I think we all think the same. We can do what we need to do and want to do. It's pretty awesome. Well, one thing I love about, um, you know, the sort of romance and the legend of the Arabian, but it turns out to actually be factual as some of the DNA evidence is coming in, is that the Arabian blood um, really flows through all modern horses. Now, how, how did that come about and why? First and foremost, an Arabian horse was bred and used as a war horse. So during the era of, of Alexander the Great, two-thirds of the known world was conquered on the back of an Arabian horse. Uh, the Ottomans, when they went north into Austria and Hungary, they took 300,000 captive, captive horses from the Arab region into that part of the world. And because they were so strong, because they were so intelligent, because they were so fast, those horses were used to cross on all the royal stables throughout Europe. The Moors took them into Spain. 
and that blood was integrated into the horses that were in the Iberian Peninsula. In the Americas, Cortez and Hernandez, they, in the 1500s, 1520, 1550, they brought hundreds of Arab blood horses from Spain into the Americas. And in 1725, a, a gentleman brought a Arabian stallion in that became the grandfather of the quarter horse breed. But they all descend from three specific Arabian horse lines, the Godolphin Arabian, the Barley Turk, and I'm going to do. Yeah. But anyway, three Arabian stallions are the, f the father of all these breeds. That is remarkable. Well, you know, we all always hear about Arabians being high-spirited, hot-blooded, skittish, um, and I always say it's because Arabians are so smart and love their riders so much that they want to protect one from anything, including a leaf on the ground. But with, <laughs> with that sort of nature, why were they um, such favorite mounts of generals? Just because of the other characteristics, or? Well, I think there's more to that leaf yeah, on the ground please story. Please do. No, there's more to that leaf on okay, the ground story. Let's hear it. No, you tell us, because it sounded like maybe... Oh, yes, I've, I've met many leaves on the ground. Okay. Um. <laughs> it sounded like there was a sidebar to that. Uh, the, First, um, these Arabian horses truly, it's not folklore, lived in the tent with their owners, especially the mares, because they, uh, they kept the mares inside because they didn't want them nickering. So the horses had to live in close proximity to the humans. They were fed camel's milk and dates, and they s survived, and man survived because of the partnership with these Arabian horses. As the world moved forward and generals like Napoleon or Washington needed a horse that was, had a lot of endurance, had a lot of stamina, and was very strong because of the density of their bone, thing, the Arabian horse was the obvious mount for those generals and rulers who needed a trustworthy horse for them to, and then to cross on to the local breeds to make them better, stronger, and more intelligent. Very interesting. Well, um, speaking of endurance, um, it's not uncommon when people learn that I ride endurance to ask me uh, if it's like Hidalgo. Well, in fact, it isn't similar at all. Hidalgo is this multi-day race that went on and on and on. Um, and modern endurance is actually a highly regulated international sport um, that is monitored fully by veterinarians. But the real question here is about the horse. Would Hidalgo, a Pinto Mustang, have had Arabian blood um, because of what you were talking about, DeSoto and? I, I, most researchers and people that have delved deep into that subject say yes. There, that horse's DNA had to include Arabians to do what it did. That's, it's a remarkable thing. Well, I think some people, you've, you've mentioned all these generals who rode on horses, but I think some people who may not be familiar with Arabians may be more familiar than they know. I'm thinking of famous paintings by the likes of Rubens and Delacroix, and equestrian statuary, such as the Sam Houston statue across the street from the entrance of the museum. And for contemporary example, Kahindi Wiley, who did the, uh, the President Obama um, portrait, he has just had mounted a huge um, monolithic, not a monolithic, but a very huge uh, statue in Richmond called Rumors of War. Now, th from a distance, it looks like very traditional equestrian military statuary. But if you look more closely, um, the rider is a dreadlocked black man. This was clearly a counter Confederate message, yet nonetheless, Wiley did choose an Arabian stallion to em emphasize the message. Are these just romanticized images or um, did, were these really the very, I know we, they rode them, but were they really the favorite beloved mounts of, of these generals and, and leaders? Yes. In diaries and personal writings of several of the people that I've mentioned, George Washington had an Arabian-blooded stallion named Blueskin. That was his chosen mount. Napoleon 
same. Um, Ulysses Grant had two Arabian stallions given to him by the Sultan of Oman, and those were his favorite mounts. Leopard, I think, yeah. was one of them. Yep. So, and to the point about the artistry of these horses, the reason I think, I do believe it's somewhat romanticized because all of these people didn't, but when you look at an Arabian horse versus some other breeds, and I love all horses, so don't want to get in any argument with any of you all, <laughs> but uh, an Arabian is never static. They're always, they, they look like they're coming and springing from life and between their tails and their heads up high, you always feel that there's a sense of power and motion and forward and looking out and in their own essence and viewpoint conquering what they're viewing. So I think there is a romantic interpretation and we have a brilliant sculptor in the room tonight who can speak to that. And if you all get a chance to meet Carol, Carol here. Can you give a little wave? She's absolutely, she's been awarded incredible prizes in the White House because of her artwork and she's a sculptor and she can talk to that in our in the and reception. And everybody check out her gorgeous pendant on her necklace which I understand she also did. But she can speak to that. Is it romanticized or is it real? Because I, she'll have a great opinion on that. Well and of course Bedouin poetry and so much in literature they're often called drinkers of the wind because of these wonderful flaring nostrils and but these things had practical purposes purposes too. Everything about an Arabian is about the strength. Desert isn't that much sand, a lot of it's bedrock. And they had, everything was designed for heat transfer. And so they were very practical. And, practical and to animals. that, a lot of people ask me, are those tail carriages natural? Are those weird? What, what do you do to them? And that was part of evolution's gift to the Arabian horse for its ability to survive. Because with that tail up and those nostrils flared, they could take a maximum amount of oxygen in to have the stamina, but their tails also, instead of being clamped, they elevated and it was an ability to aerate all the way through as they were running because up the air could flow under them and it was a cooling system. That's marvelous. Well, Michael and I, you and I often do, um, along with Anne, speak for great lengths of time. Um, Chase, with apologies, sometimes you don't love all this horse talk when we get together. Uh, <laughs> uh, but you're getting better at it. Uh, but <laughs> <laughs> so we could talk all night, but I, I think people were offered index cards um, when they came in. And if you have Q&As, you'll see um, two wonderful, our wonderful volunteers, Ben and Shana, coming around if you want to pass those questions. And I'll just continue asking a qu few questions until we get yours. Um, so breeding horses at an international level is pretty rarefied. How much does an Arabian, a hybrid Arabian cost, and what can an average person do if they can't afford one of these hybrid horses? Well, doing your research and exhaustingly looking helps you minimize the extravagant expense at the onset. One of the most famous mares that came out of the Shaka program was Aladid Al Shakab's mother, who was purchased for ten thousand dollars. There are other examples that um, of million dollar horses, but you can buy any uh, horse at any level. You can buy a five hundred dollar horse and be in love in Arabian and trail ride it. Or if you want to compete on the world level, it's going to be a little more expensive. Yeah. Well, and. I mean, uh, another shout out to Emmett Ross, who is in the house, um, used to um, really develop the, the Al Shakab Endurance Program and a couple of my rider friends also here. And I, I know he and Daryl and Butler also here, very famous in the endurance world, um, sometimes find, you know, ex racehorses who have finished their race career or maybe weren't winning in the Arabian horse world. And they can be sourced fairly inexpensively, although people have now learned their tricks, so they're more expensive. And those become amazing champion horses. Um, now, I think people are often interested in how these horses, I know we were talking about uh, Hariri flying around. How does horse transport for, for horse work? It's, it's 
easy actually you, we if it's exclusively a horse cargo we just load them up in a crate that's designed for three horses normally if it's a stallion you put those stallion in the crate by himself but you can easily put three mares in a crate you put them on a heist and put them in the plane and I would bet some of you in this room have on occasion been on a KLM flight that had horses in it at one point and you didn't even know the horses were in the back. So they, they combine it, but it's, it's very easy. And when we brought Marwan al Shakab in, he flew in a FedEx plane from New York City here and was all by himself. <laughs> he got FedExed. He got FedExed. <laughs> I love it. Well, this we can get on the web or afterwards, but I, I love that somebody's asking for your address in New Ellen. Watch out, Anne. Here they come. <laughs> um, what is the earliest evidence of the Arabian breed, and do you think um, they are evolutionary or a gift from God? Is that a submitted question, or is that yours? <laughs> okay. Um, well, the cave paintings in France d depict an Arabian horse, and they're ancient. They're depictions of an Oriental-style horse that are tens of thousands of years old. Um, I think domestication was about 3,000, 4,000? Four, four, yeah, four. Yeah, we're, we're specific up here, but we can ride well. Well, the, it, but the horse, horses have evolved, and to the, to the god question wh whoever you believe in i believe all of this is a gift from whatever god you choose to believe in because it's too special not to be and the other half of this question uh, is obviously somebody who's already an expert on arabians and will love to talk to you afterwards <laughs> about tensile strength the bones and everything so great question but i am going to move on um what food do arabians eat in qatar and are there still wild desert horses in qatar and i i guess i'd like to add a little bit to that the question of who gets to decide what an arabian horse is i mean i remember being in the uh sort of back country of oman and some tribal tribesmen who'd been breeding horses for 10 generations were a little upset that their horse was not an Arabian. There's been written record of Arabian horse lineage now for 200 years. Prior to that, it was an oral history that was believed because the Bedouin owners were so passionate about keeping their mares and keeping them away from stallions, so they knew everything that was going on with those horses. Uh, but they're well-documented. Um, registries for the last 200 years. Um, that, that is quite remarkable. I think the... the uh, Ours in America started in 1908 from... Uh, and, and that was born out of the Chicago World's Fair that happened in 1893 when um, Turkey sent several 15 maybe horses to the Chicago World's Fair and an entrepreneur named Henry Babson was so taken with him that he, by 1908, we had a flourishing Arabian horse registry here in America. That's remarkable. Um, what year did Hariri come into your life? So also, how old is he? And does he have any special feed or requirements? Hariri, I've known since he was born. He was born in Italy. He was born in at a ranch in Tuscany. and. Uh, when the first time I saw him, he was this rose gray with an orange mane and tail and this proud bearing, and he was exquisite from the beginning. He came to America as a yearling, and in his very first show, which was in Scottsdale, Arizona, he was champion, and Scottsdale holds the largest Arabian horse show in the world, and he won and debuted as a unanimous champion. and. That year, he won his first national championship. What does Hariri eat? Okay, we've <laughs> determined carrots. carrots. Sure. Determined <laughs> carrots. Hariri is the easiest, happy-go-luckiest horse. If you give it to him, he'll eat it. He's just game for whatever. There, he is not a finicky horse. He, in November, he flew from here to Doha for a photo session to Paris to the horse show, came back, never missed a meal, never fretted. And won a, a platinum world championship yeah. in the... In the <laughs> but w there, and whoever asked that question, I'll give you the specifics of his diet, but he'll eat anything. That's remarkable. Does breeding always result in better horses? And are 
I, I guess our Arabians demonstrably better now than they were 100 years ago. And are there any problems that come up similar to hip dysplasia that is affecting some large dog breeds? I mean, so th is there some overbreeding that's going on or any problems with that? There, uh, th there are problems that have arisen out of too much inbreeding. So yes to that. There, um, you, you do have to be selective. And the question of if Arabians better today than 100 years ago, I think, is a subjective question and not an objective question. So I would leave that to the person to look and study and determine that for themselves. Well, I, I think I've, one thing that um, Sheikh Hamad, the now father Amir, said is that he wanted to de develop strong horses and ones with moral character. So from what I understand about the Al-Shaka breeding program, and of course you would know more, is there has look is important, but function is the key. I mean, if you have a horse that is no longer, you know, has what Arabians are known for, the super strong bones and that thing, then you failed. Is that, would you think that's a char fair characterization? Yes, definitely. And on February 12th, in the year 2000, a horse was born named Marwan al-Shakab, who's Hariri's father, who in one generation has changed the physical nature of an Arabian horse from, he, he, he was such a strong, preponent stallion, prepotent stallion. He gave a horse in first generation a different structure, a shorter back, a more vertical frame, because we were inbreeding one certain line to which we needed an outcross. So, and it, it, it is really challenging to breed horses, and it shouldn't be taken lightly. You just really need to study it because it is hard to do. Yeah, I th I think that may be a gift from God, the ability to breed. Um, I watched Sheikh Hamad bin Ali, and you know he has he's talked about having stallions that he'd like to breed, but not having found the right mare. Um, he hasn't found just the right mare for these particular stallions, and somehow these things come to him and to you. Well, in five generations, there are 64 horses in those five generations, and incredibly, all those horses can play a role, and sometimes you really don't want that to come out. Uh, so Hariri's father's Marwan, Marwan's father's Ghazal. His grandmother was a mare named Ijora who had big, wide ears. We don't like that. We like small, tippy, intelligent ears. Well, occasionally, not very often, those ears come out of poor Grandma Kajora. And we have somebody in our audience that imported Kajora back in the 80s. Mike Weinstein, he's been breeding for that long. But wow. we, we all, we used to, we, uh, it, her mama's ears came out. <laughs> but still a lovely mare. <laughs> yeah, very. Um, here's a question, and I'll answer part of it. Is the black stallion from the same bloodline, and have you met him? Well, actually, I have met the horse who played the Arabian stallion, uh, played the black stallion in the movie, but he wasn't black. He got painted. He was living out on, if anybody knows uh, Do Dr. Denton Cooley, he was living on the property next door. So it's some times he'd come up to their fence line. He, he had white socks that they oh, dyed. That's what he was yeah. Okay, thank and, you. It wasn't all. He was bred by Dr. Cuello in San Antonio, Texas, and they found him, and that, they did dye those socks, but that was a purebred Arabian stallion that played that role. And he was also a very successful show horse in the Arabian horse scene in performance classes. Okay, but not any of the bloodlines that are showing up in the Al Shaka, do you no. think? No. Yeah, so different. They, the, the family didn't really use him as a breeding horse too much. I see. But he, he was, um, did he, he was a stallion, obviously, he was, and uh, kept the, a stallion. The whole, f the whole family showed him in everything from side saddle to costume to trail classes before he was discovered and made Walter Farley's ideal black stallion. Right. A book of my dreams. Now, this one, I'm, um, what are the, Araf I, I'm sorry, the Arabian, oh, what are the Arabian gates? Ah, I thought, okay, what are the Arabian gates? 
walk trot canter yeah. you know, they're in, in in the desert you really don't want them trotting because that's a more laborious gait and they didn't have the need to do a lot of trotting they were galloping and raiding herds and living life and getting from a to b so uh they there it's a natural gait to trot but in d going through deep sand they just wanted them to gallop but all of them are necessary and used. But very floaty gait, wouldn't you say? I mean, that's something there. Yep, yep. Well, one thing um, about the Arabians and something that is often the horses were, camels were used more point to point on long Bedouin marches, and the horse would be used more for the precision raid, was my understanding. Yes, because camels could ex exist on no water horses had to have some sort of liquid which ended up being camel's milk but the horses were to be in and out stealth strategic raid a village get what they wanted which other countries outside the Middle East um, are prominent with with Arabian breeding Brazil is breeding great horses. I judged the Brazilian Nationals this year, and their stock was fantastic. Of course, breeding in Poland has been going on since the 17th century, and they have some of the most successful breeding horses on the planet. In Russia, they had a, a, a stud farm named Tursk, which it contributes so many important horses in our pedigrees. Uh, Australia, all over the world, other than Antarctica. And I guess I would, <laughs> other than Antarctica. Well, maybe we'll have to change that. Sheikh Ahmad, where are you? <laughs> um, also, I'd have to say that France has been highly successful in breeding endurance horses. And I think now a lot of people are sort of following their lead on that. Um, but what about celebrities? I know there, we know all these sheikhs who are breeding, but are there any celebrities we might recognize who are also um, involved with the Arabian breed? Houstonians, of course, know Patrick Swayze and his wife Lisa were very involved and they were good friends of ours and we were, we were able to go to their ranch in Las Vegas, New Mexico and see their horses at home. Um, one of my favorite people that ever owned Arabian horses was Mike Nichols. He had horses since he was a kid. Candace Bergeron, she had, uh, Wayne Newton still today has one of the most successful programs in the world. And I think we will close on a, a note, I hope what will be encouragement, Michael. Somebody is asking, um, they say they haven't had a chance to ride when they were younger. Um, is an Arabian too much to handle for a um, somebody who's not still young? We have, no, not at all. <laughs> not at all. I, I just think you have to have the right horse and have the right advice. And an Arabian can be a great partner. I, I have watched a 90-year-old lady successfully show her horses in Estes Park, Colorado, and she just, that horse, and still today there's a man who rides a English horse at our national level, and he's in his late 80s, so absolutely. That's amazing. Well, I hope um, you all will join it, join us afterwards down in the butterfly lobby, so exit to the left for some refreshments. And mostly, please, please thank our amazing, very own Michael Byatt. Thank you very much. What a pleasure. Thank you.